In this video, we'll begin talking about matrices that represent rotations in three dimensions with respect to a Cartesian basis. Our ultimate goal is to come up with a matrix that represents an arbitrary rotation. But that's way too complicated to do all at once. Yes, we could pursue the standard procedure where we apply the linear transformation to each of the basis vectors, decompose the resulting images with respect to the same basis, and use those coefficients to populate the columns of the matrix. That's the standard approach, and it will work. However, the result will be so impenetrably complicated that we won't find it useful at all. It will provide us with no insight whatsoever. So we have to do something different. We have to approach this problem more creatively. So here's what we'll do. We'll break up this single complicated rotation into a series of three much simpler, more elementary rotations. And that's what this video is devoted to. We'll focus on those three simpler, more elementary rotations, and we'll come up with the matrices that represent them in this basis. So let me put down the sculpture and begin our discussion. So what will our three elementary rotations be? And by the way, we'll only need two out of those three rotations, but for completeness sake, let's talk about all three. Well, those will be the elementary rotations with respect to axes that are aligned with our basis vectors. So we've been calling our basis vectors first, second, and third, but we're also used to x, y, and z. So we'll call the axis aligned with E1 our x-axis, this will be our y-axis, and this will be our z-axis. That's why the three matrices that we'll come up with on the board are called R sub X, R sub Y, and R sub Z. They will represent the three elementary rotations with respect to these stationary axes. And you will notice, in terms of notation, that we no longer put the angle in the subscript, the angle by which we're rotating. It will now go elsewhere. It will now go in parentheses in front of this symbol. So a small notational change. Now we also need to talk about what counterclockwise means. Counterclockwise had a very clear meaning in the plane. It's completely or almost completely uncontroversial. This is the counterclockwise rotation and this is the clockwise rotation. But when you're talking about an axis in three dimensions, what does counterclockwise mean? So if this is the axis, so rotation with respect to this axis is something like this, right? The axis stays put and everything else rotates in this very simple fashion around it. It's almost like a two-dimensional rotation. It's almost like a rotation in the plane, except all of these planes that are perpendicular to this axis do the same thing. So it really is a simple sort of transformation that we've studied more or less thoroughly before when we talked about uh, uh, rotations in the plane. But now back to the subject of what counterclockwise means. If you think that this means counterclockwise and you swing the camera around or I swing the whole thing around and now you look at it from this point, from this angle, then now it looks clockwise. So once again, I'll keep the rotation going. Counterclockwise, I'm keeping it going and look, now it's clockwise. So we have to be a little bit more careful specifying direction. So we'll talk about counterclockwise as we're staring down the axis. So the axis has a direction. It's not just a straight line. It's a ray. It's a ray with a direction. So when we say counterclockwise, it means we're staring down the axis. Now let's do it together. You're staring down the axis. And this then is the counterclockwise direction. Simple enough. Now we're ready to come up with these matrices and of course this discussion will leverage heavily upon our discussion in the plane because these rotations are pretty much as simple as rotations in the plane. That's what makes them so simple and good candidates for our elementary rotations. Well, here we go. Let's start with this one. This is rotation with respect to this axis and it's in the counterclockwise direction. So if you consider any vector, let's now do something like this. So this is the axis. Here is the vector. 
So let me now align it with the x-axis. And this is the rotation we're talking about. So I'm rotating this little vector with respect to this axis. And counterclockwise is this direction because you have to imagine the viewer looking down this axis, staring down the axis. So you will notice that the x component of this vector does not change. That's what it means to rotate with respect to this axis. The x component doesn't change. And the y and z components, second and third, undergo a simple rotation like the one that we've already discussed. So now all we have to do is capture what we just observed in a matrix. So I think it's pretty clear that the first column of this matrix is 1, 0, 0. Let me make it a slightly larger 1. 1, actually make clear that it's 1. 1, 0, 0. These are the numbers that will make the x component stay put. And what happens in the y and z component is a simple rotation in the plane, where the y-axis rotates counterclockwise, counterclockwise, towards the z-axis. So in this, in this part of the matrix, we'll have our standard rotation matrix as we encountered in the plane. Because after all, this is just like a simple rotation in the yz plane or the two, three plane. So I will actually not write the angle or even write out the word cosine because you know what goes in there. So I'll just do it in a way that everybody will understand by just writing C for cosine and S for sine. So we have cosine, sine, minus sine, cosine. What a good looking matrix. And we're done with the first transformation. Actually the one that we ultimately won't use. But that depends on our choice of parameters that describe the complicated rotations. In other paradigms, this matrix is very much used. But here it is. Here is the matrix, our first three-dimensional rotation matrix. This is the matrix that represents rotation in three dimensions with respect to the x-axis in the counterclockwise direction. And the angle would, of course, go here. Cosine of the angle minus sine, sine of the angle cosine of the angle. Now let's do this one, which is the most complicated of the three because there is a sine, minus sine to think about. This is the rotation with respect to the y-axis, which is an axis that points, as you can see in the picture, in this direction, away from you. And what does counterclockwise mean? It means this. Right, so to us, looking at y3, excuse me, e3, e1, it looks in the clockwise direction because the y-axis points away from us. That observer that stares down the y-axis is actually looking at our backs, at my back. It's looking directly at you, which is opposite of how we've been looking at it right now. So the rotation is in the clockwise direction, so we have to be careful there. So, first let's take care of the easy part. The easy part is that the y component of whatever vector is being rotated, here's what's going on. That I don't, is that helping? I hope you can see what's going on. Okay, the y component stays put, remains unchanged, and that's captured by putting a one here. And the only action, the only rotation, happens with the first and the third component, the x and the z components. So these entries will go here, 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 and here. That funny, still block structured matrix. Just like here we have a block matrix, here it's a little bit broken up, but still has that block structure. And the sign requires a little bit of thinking through. So I will write it down directly but maybe I'll let you think it through because it's not complicated, but you just have to take your time and understand that the sign is placed correctly. So what will happen here is cosine, negative sine, that's where the negative sign goes, sine, cosine. Let me give you one simple half explanation. 
if rotation was happening in our familiar way from one to three. So here we would ignore this row and this row and just looked at one, two, three, four as a two by two matrix. If rotation was happening from one to three, then it would be our familiar cosine, sine, minus sine, cosine matrix. That's if the rotation was going from one to three. But counterclockwise with respect to E2 means from E3 to one. So it's opposite. It's either minus the angle or the inverse. Both ways are equivalent. Both ways of thinking are the same thing. So that's why the minus goes here. So if this totally convinces you, you're done. If this doesn't completely convince you, then what you have to do is pursue the standard procedure, but in this more limited planar sense, where you rotate E3 by an angle alpha, and then re-express it with respect to E1 and E3, and you'll just see that this is exactly the two by two matrix that results. In either case, that's the matrix. Now moving on to RZ, RZ, counterclockwise with respect to the Z axis, rotates E1 towards E2 when it's counterclockwise. So it's precisely the rotation that we've been discussing all along and that's the rotation that we know best. So we have a one now in this place because it leaves the Z component completely unchanged. Maybe this would have been a smart matrix to start with. Too late now. And now we have our familiar rotation matrix right here. Minus sine, cosine. There you go. These are the three matrices that represent the elementary counterclockwise directions with respect to the axes aligned with the basis vectors. In the next video, we will begin putting these matrices together to express an arbitrary rotation. And the arbitrary rotation will be specified in terms of the Euler angles. A great name, a great idea, and it'll be a very fun discussion.